Thanks, James. So for this just entry in the webinar, I'm gonna I'm gonna wait about 30 seconds to allow others to join. And then we'll proceed with some introductions. As I know that yesterday, yeah, people is joining. Yesterday we had like 200, over 200 participants, which is quite a lot. I think that we can start now. Um, yes, people is still joining, I think. Yeah, we're gonna start. So hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning, afternoon or evening, depending on your location. I know that people is joining us this afternoon from different places around the world, from the US, from different uh, countries in Europe, from different countries, uh, also in Latin America, and of course from Jordan and from the Middle East. Uh, my name is Emilia Yellow. And I am the Maria Sladowska Curie Postdoctoral Fellow here at the Ash Center at the Harvard Kennedy School, and also the Department of Sociology at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. Before starting, I want to share with you some announcements on, the, on behalf of the Ash Center. And the Ash Center would like to acknowledge the land on which Harvard sits as the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people and a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. Um, today's event will include live English Arabic interpretation, so you can select your preferred language by clicking on the globe icon on the right side of the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. I think that that's pretty easy, so you will see that you have the English and Arabic channel. I'm on the English channel now. And also to let you know that this event is being recorded and the video will be made publicly available on the Ash Center YouTube channel in the coming, uh, in the coming uh, days. That being said, um, you are welcome to submit questions anytime throughout the duration of the event. Please send them uh, via the Q&A &A button at the bottom of your screen instead of submitting them via the chat. So you, we can use the chat just to drop off uh, comments. So now I would like to briefly introduce our three panelists, excellent panelists and leaders that they come from, they come from Jordan. First, we have uh, Nisreen Ahmad. Nisreen is a co-founder and director of, uh, sorry? <laughs> Hi, Nisreen. And, Hi. and director of AHEL, a nonprofit created in 2011 that has coached over 20 campaigns and trained over 2,000 people in organizing in the Middle East, namely in Jordan, in Palestine, in Lebanon, and in Syria. Nisreen is committed to creating learning and solidarity aspects, spaces that inform and sustain leaders and activists around the world. In 2012, uh, she coordinated the Leading Change Global Gathering, bringing together more than 100 organizers from around the world. Trained as a lawyer, she's also a Harvard Kennedy School alumni and a former fellow here at the Ash Center. And uh, over the last decade, Nisreen has been collaborated, uh, collaborating with Professor Marshall Gunn. Um, well, I could like to also take this opportunity to congratulate you, Nisreen, and your team, uh, Ahel, because to the, this year, 2021, it's the 10th anniversary of, of Ahel. And also, I could like to acknowledge the excellent work that you have been doing, not just in Jordan, but in, in different countries in, in the Middle East and serving also as an example to other organizations uh, worldwide. So congratulations to you and to your team and welcome on board. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Our second panelist today is Rim Aslan. Um, RIM is a specialist in gender and anti-discrimination at the International Labor Organization Regional Office for the Arab states. In 2015, she co-led the successful launch of the National Committee for Pay Equity in Jordan. Um, RIM has worked for over 15 years with the Canadian government, both in Amman and in Ottawa. And she was a recipient of the very prestigious Middle East and North Africa Director General's Award of 2009. 
She has a vast experience and consulting expertise in the field of international development, management, and women economic empowerment, having worked with the International Labor Organization, with the World Bank in Saudi Arabia, with the USAID funded project, with Global Affairs Canada, with the Adam Smith International, and Freedom House, amongst many other places. So I, I'm gonna stop here. So thank you very much, Reem, for accepting being with us this afternoon and, and welcome on board also. Thank you so much, Emilia. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank you. And our third panelist this afternoon is Nariman al Shawahin. Nariman is also based in Jordan. Uh, Nori Naman, is, she's based in Erbil, where the campaign started. She was a teacher in a private school for 15 years and joined the Stand Up with the Teachers campaigns at its very beginning in 2015. She was eventually fired from her, from her school for attending the periodic meetings of the campaigns. However, this did not stop Nariman from continuing uh, organizing. At present, she co-coordinates the stand-ups with the teachers' campaign, and she uh, in five uh, in five uh, Jordanian cities. Since her involvement in the campaign, she has been advocating and organizing for women's rights in Jordan, representing the campaign at a regional and at international level. So, Nariman is passionate about learning and education. Also, thank you very much, Nariman, for being with us today, and welcome. Okay, so um, when we were planning how to make the most of, of this time together with these exceptional leaders, um, we thought that it could be very useful to spend some time upfront giving a little bit of background about the, about the case study. So I will use the next 10, 13 minutes or so to give an overview of the, of the research case. And this will help to then invite the three panelists to comment, not myself on the result, but through comment, through our conversation on, on the results um, I obtained. The research case is published, so everyone has access to it. I know that uh, we put the link of the published case to the description of this event, so I'm sure that uh, most of you have already access, uh, have already seen the, the case. I'm gonna start sharing my screen now. So let me do this, okay. 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 Do you see my, my first slide? Yeah, perfect. So, well, the work I'm sharing with you today, um, it's framing the research project I've been, I've been doing since June 2019 called Narratives for Change. Uh, which is funded by the European Union Horizon 2020 uh, program. And in it, I've been, I've been working in collaboration with Professor Marshall Gantz here at the Harvard uh, Kennedy School at the Ash Center. Broadly speaking, the goal of the Narrative for Change research is to study how public narratives is being used for the development of individual and collective leadership in different areas of actions, as well as cultural context and the impacts achieved. As part of the Narrative for Change project, we did a survey, the results uh, of which will be published in the, in the coming weeks. And we did three case studies, studies uh, three case studies, each of which uh, is focused on exploring the use of public narrative by different initiatives and campaigns. And one of these case studies is about the Stand Up With The Teachers campaign, the, the case that we will speak today. Before going any further, I don't want to take for granted and assume that everyone who is uh, joining us today knows what public narrative is, but I will spend just like a couple of minutes talking about this. So public narrative is a way of linking the power of narrative, the power of stories, to the work of leadership by learning to tell a story of self, a story of us, and a story of now. So with the story of self, uh, is a story which shows people who I am and why I care for what I do by describing moments or, or experiences from my life, which I consider very meaningful. With the story, of, the story of us is a story which links to a bigger us and helps other people um, to understand the values that we have in common. And the story of now is a story which invites us to act together now. So 
and it communicates the very urgency of the moment. It's it really communicates that we need to take action, not in the near future, but yeah. now. So narrative is a way we can access the emotional resources embedded in our values to transform threats to which we can react fearfully into challenges to which we can respond hopefully and engage. So narrative is deeply embedded in how we can foster an enabling agentic action. And as Professor Marshall Gantz reminds us, stories communicate our values through the language of the heart, our emotions, our emotions. And it is what we feel, our hopes, our cares, our obligations, not simply what we know that can inspire us with the courage to act. Um, Professor Marshall Gantz and his collaborators began developing uh, a pedagogy of this practice as Marshall uh, calls this, this, the pedagogy of, of, of this practice for leadership in 2006 and adapted it over the last 15 years in both online and offline uh, courses at the Harvard Kennedy School and in workshops, in projects, in campaigns, such as the 2008 Obama for President campaign. And in this map that you see, um, it, this a map that portrays the results of the survey that we did in the framework of the project. And we found that individuals using public narratives are con currently residing in 75 countries. So all the countries colored in blue are countries where there is someone who is using public narratives. So, you can see that most of them are in the US, but also like spread um, all, our, all across the globe. Um, so here, from here, my, my research interest and my curiosity when I started to research on public narratives and the scope and track it, and track it has gained in the last 15 years. And, um, and about the case study, the case study on the stand up with the teachers campaign. This, the, the case was guided by two main research questions. Of course, the research question was framed and embedded in the larger narrative for change uh, project. The first research question was, how are public narrative being used for the development of individual and collective leadership capacity in the framework of the campaign? And linked to this, in what way is this contributing to develop collective organizational capacity? So to build power and to build community. Um, I think that it's important to spend just like a couple of minutes talking about what's the context in, in Jordan about the, the, pay, the, the pay gap in, in private education. Rim is here and Rim uh, can speak more about this because she was the, the leader of this, of this study. But in 2013, the International Labor Organization published a study reporting astonishing data on the severe violation of labor rights of women working in private education both in primary schools and in universities. Women working in private education are overrepresented in all job categories. And just to give you an idea of the gender pay difference, the research showed that um, the gender pay gap was 41.6% 41 41 in private schools and 23.1% in private universities, of course, women in work situations. So with this study, what the ILO did was to capture with data and make public a situation of inequality and labor rights violation that was very well known in the country by women that were for so many years employed in private schools themselves. So it was framed, framed in this context uh, where the campaign was launched in the city of Erby, actually where, where Nari Man comes from, in, this, in, the, in 2015 sponsored by the Jordanian National Committee for Pay Equity and by the International Labor Organization and initially coached by the organization uh, AHEL. And in early 2015, AHEL started working to recruit a group of teachers which could, uh, which could want to constitute itself as a leadership team. And it was at this very moment, so very early on, when uh, the organizing model and when public narratives uh, was, uh, was adopted in the campaign. Regarding the methods, I'm not going to go through that because all that is in, in, the, in the study, but just I want to mention that this was a qualitative research. 
in which I did online field work with teachers, leaders of the campaign, as well as other stakeholders. I did daily life stories, interviews, and focus groups. I also used secondary documentation to triangulate and gain context on the situation. And overall, I had like approximately 39 hours of recording conversations, which were transcribed, and with some of them were also translated because part of the fieldwork was done in Arabic uh, with the help of, a, of an interpreter. And we analyzed the data with NVivo. And of course, all the fieldwork was done in online through Zoom because we started the fieldwork in February 2020 with, when, when the pandemic hit. But that was not our year, as I, as I um, thought that it could be. OK, um, I'm not going to share all the findings with you, but I think that it's important to share how I organize my data, because this, this will allow later on to, to, to discuss the results. As you see, um, our first categorization that I did was distinguishing the use of public narratives in, in two dimensions, internal and external. And for internal, I, I define this internal dimension when, when teachers were using public narratives with each other. So um, for instance, in one-on-one -on -one meetings, when running the, the popular education circles that we will uh, talk later on, and externally, when teachers and when the campaign were using public narratives beyond the team itself. So for instance, when using public narratives to engage with, with policymakers or to recruit other teachers beyond the campaign itself. And then I decide, I defined uh, two other axes of analysis. So the settings of usage. So in these two settings that were, that public narratives were being coached and, coached and, and trained. And then the impact. So, the, uh, and by the, by impacts, I mean um, public narrative as a leadership practice that either contributes or mediates impacts at four different different dimensions. Of course, in 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 many cases, it's not the direct relation between having used public narratives and achieving something, but it's this mediation that allows something. As you see, the first. The first uh, dimension was uh, at the individual level, so impacts on teachers themselves as social actors. And this could be, for instance, like the enhancement of subjects' um, agenting capacities, or because of the confidence that, that teachers gain, that they, they really daring to take the lead and speak, uh, speak in public. The second level uh, was. The second level was um, the campaign as a team, as an organization, as an organized community of actors. And in this case, for instance, uh, defining the, the use of public narrative contributed to define a shared purpose, facilitated how to work together. It really enhanced and strengthened uh, social relationships. And that was very important for to build team culture and for instance, to hold each other accountable. That was at the internal. Uh, level. And then we defined um, uh, the sociocultural domain or, or, or dimension, which uh, I refer to, to the societal dimension. So understood in the sense of those impacts at the public sphere. So at this level, both tangible and intangible impacts took place. For instance, um, the fact that before the campaign, this was not a topic present in the at the political or at public agenda. And then um, the, after the campaign, uh, it is now. And then the, later, uh, finally, the institutional domain. So public narrative mediating again in this in this domain is not because of, of the direct uh, impact. We have to understand this in the context of an organizing model. And when changes do impact on the structures through getting uh, institutionalized by the, by a political change. So, for instance, uh, the fact that the the fact that the uh, of applying the unified contract, of the fact of creating new ways to communicate with political authorities, we can discuss uh, more about this. Uh, as I mentioned, this table you have this table in page ten of the of the report. And just some takeaways that I think that are, are, are important to mention. Well, narrativity and its, and its relas relational, experiential, experiential and reflexive dimension made this framework to be deeply 
uh, to be rooted on a dialogic and intersubjective relationship. And this is very important because this is what enhanced to create at a team level, a sense of us, a sense of shared identity. And this shared identity was not based on a categorical, um, on a cat on, on a on a on a on a categorical um, identity. It was not based. It was not based on the fact of being women or being teacher or being Jordanian or being migrant. No, it was because of um, because of a shared experience, because sharing uh, sharing common values, and because of being able to empathize with each other. And another important thing to to remark here is that uh, once public narratives uh, were learned. Many teachers uh, started using them uh, in the private sphere, for instance. They were learning public narratives and coaching public narratives within the campaign with each other, but then they started adopt adopting this framework to communicate with their family members, with their friends, so beyond the campaign. And this is important because of key role that coaching play here. So coaching this pedagogy of practice, as, as Professor Marshall Gans call it, so this is pivotal for the leadership development and for the self-management of teams. So far, uh, we have observed and the evidence show that shows that public narrative facilitates building these relationships of trust and solidarity. And because of having been used since the very beginning, it is what enhances this agentic capacity and what trains teachers in, in their agency. And this is what then sets the common ground to agree how to work together and gives and, and enhances the team to, for instance, define and common norms and accept uh, and accept provides provides the team uh, on how to on how to work together. I'm gonna leave it here. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Okay. Because I think that at this point, um, yes, you cannot see my screen now, no? Okay, that's good. So at this point, I think that it's very important that, yes, I want to, to call my the panelists to, to join the conversation. And um, my first question is, well, with the publication of the, of the ILO report in 2013, um, uh, it was, um, on the gender pay difference, uh, the ILO and the Ministry of Labor decided to, to use an organizing strategy in, in the campaign. So um, my question was for you, Rim, and also maybe you, Rim, can um, add to this. And I wonder on what base did the International Labor Organization saw the potential to, of, of, an, of an organizing strategy um, as an effective approach to contest the situation of rights violation that was going on. Because I, yeah, to what extent that was, um, how, how was that it happened? I think that you can comment a little bit on this. Thank you, Amelia, for the question. Actually, if we go back to the basics, it's a mandate of the ILO to promote decent work and advance social justice. So for us, when we did the study, uh, we thought with the Ministry of Labor, either we move to a different sector, and actually we were thinking of the health sector, and with the National Committee for Pay Equity, we decided, no, we need to change uh, what is going on on the ground, meaning, okay, we know that there is a gender pay gap, there is something that we need to do about it. So that's when we started thinking of ways to engage the teachers and make a difference. And that's when we reached out to Ahel and asked them for support to, to use the community organizing because we also were uh, exposed to the, to, the, to the methodology. So that's when we started looking at uh, the places where we can start and usually in all countries, usually you start with the capital. But in our case, we found out the most discrimination was taking place in Irbid, in particular, where Nariman is from. So we moved to Irbid, and there we started to uh, establish the core team. And we started to put the story and the, the, sto the personal story, the story of, of the team, and so on. Now, ILO, as a matter of fact, we, we work with the, with the workers and the employers, and that's why the ILO was established in, 19, in 1919. Uh, we also work parallelly with the employers, and that's when we started thinking of also organizing the employers and looking at the employers that do provide decent work conditions in the terminology of the ILO, meaning they 
they, com they basically do provide the minimum wage and so on. So just to show that there are good employers, but at the same time, the ones that are not really uh, following the, the, the local legislation, they need, we need to do something about it. And here we started to also work with the different institutions in Jordan, uh, because also the government is part of, um, is a member of the ILO. The membership of the ILO actually constitutes of three parties, the workers, the employers and also the government. So with the government, we try to also make linkages, for example, and you mentioned a number of, uh, of uh, the violations that were taking place. Some were related to social protection and social security, some were related to uh, labor rights, and some were related actually uh, to, the, to the education part in particular. So we made the linkages between these, these three, three institutions. So we were working, you know, Ahel was playing, working on the foundation which are the teachers, organizing the teachers. The ILO was working with technical people, the different entities, but also we were amending laws. So that's when we also started working with policymakers. And here the ILO part was making all the connections, you know, what we call social dialogue. This is a terminology of the ILO. Social dialogue between the, the three parties, employers, employees and the government and that's what we try to do as much as possible during the process and of course it was an organic kind of uh, it was developing the campaign was developing organically we started in Irbid and with the support of Ahel Nariman in particular as well we were able with the, their collective voice and so on we were able to expand the campaign to different uh, regions in Jordan and now they basically they are they are nationally spread all over the country over to you Emilia thank you very much Reem that's 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 very useful, and of course, um, this idea of like this putting the social dialogue uh, organically between the different parts, it's very, it's very unique of this campaign, and I guess that of course it's what explain uh, its its success. Nisreen, do you do you want to comment on 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 something on this? <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, very quickly, I will say what uh, Reem Aslan will not say. The reason the ILO chose community organizing is because of Reem Aslan. Uh, she believes in uh, people power. So she's not the usual bureaucrat, diplomat, so forth. She's an action, um, action oriented leader. So she couldn't just, you know, see the report and wait for things to happen through the normal uh, bureaucratic channels, which don't guarantee serious change at a structural level or doesn't uh, build people power. So uh, her natural inclination was to convince the ILO, she was a consultant then to the ILO, to convince the ILO to consider um, going to the grassroots and turning that uh, written report into something much more serious. Wow. No, I yeah. Later on, we we can go deeper a little bit on the on the resistance in, uh, encountered and to what extent this can be scalable to other to other sectors. So, because you're you're talking this ring, I wonder. Well, my evidence shows that Ahel, of course, as, as I mentioned, has played a key role in this campaign, coaching coaching teachers in public narratives at the different stages, organizing training workshops, organizing. Uh, uh, team meetings, also putting together the, the popular education circles in, in different moments. So you have extensive experience coaching public narratives and so does the Agile team, coaching the leadership of the campaign in learning how to tell the story of self, the story of us, the story of now, and much more. It, that's much more than just learning how to tell your story in your public narrative in public. So I wonder how do you, how do you see the initial role that Ahel play in the campaign and how this coaching was done? And what's the role of, of Ahel now? If you can, I, I, I want you to, to explain us with detail yeah, about this, the, the, the very relevance uh, of coaching. You're on mute. Can you hear me, Emilia? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so when we first, our role over the past five years have uh, evolved uh, with, the, with the power that the teachers and the leaders of the campaign themselves evolved. Um, so we started as organizers. We were the ones who were going to running one-on-ones, trying to, uh, to have uh, house meetings or union meetings, uh, meeting the teachers, different sorts of teachers, listening to their stories, uh, 
to find those women who have acted, have uh, exercised choice in, fr in front of challenge and to create a team. So in the first phase, we were organizers, we were doing the work ourselves and we found uh, a team and that's when we met Neriman Shawahin. Um, then once there was a team for the campaign, a leadership team for the campaign, we had to take a different role because um, we were not going to lead the campaign ourselves. The, the women uh, leaders have to lead it. So we have to uh, become uh, trainers and teachers and instillers of uh, the ideas of community organizing, maybe the core of community organizers, which is uh, power to the people, um, we are all resourceful and we need to, re to organize our resources. Uh, we can put our resources to, um, to action in a very um, thoughtful way that addresses power of those oppressing us or builds our own power. So we became uh, trainers and teachers of organizing on the methodology itself or the approach itself, but also on the skills. And one of those skills is, um, or practices actually, is public narrative. There are five practices and the public narrative is one of them. And then um, in that same period, the second phase of our role, we were also facilitators of conversations that the and decisions that the teachers in the leadership team had to make. Uh, decisions regarding the, the narrative surrounding their cause, uh, decisions regarding the strategy, their specific campaign objective or goal, decisions about the structure, the teams, um, and decisions about the culture, uh, the, their collective culture. And in that period, um, it was good that we were third parties. We were outsiders to the teachers community. Um, and it was good that we facilitated based on a methodology, based on certain um, principle, principles, and, and we had a set of practices. Uh, with, with time, that also decreased as the teachers, the leaders, the women leaders became the facilitators of their own decision making and so forth. Um, but we remained coaches to the ups and downs in the campaign, to the teachers in the ups and downs. And those ups and downs can be the heart with um, um, emotional challenges or the head with strategic challenges or the hands with practical challenges. Um, and in the last phase, um, almost the last phase, starting 2017 to, the, to 2020 or 19, uh, we were the designers of the popular education uh, program. The teachers were running it and facilitating it with us, but my colleague uh, Rahaf Abdoha was the lead designer of that program. And as you write in your research, it has a, it had a huge impact on the on the teachers and on the leaders. Uh, last word is um, now our role is uh, much decreased. Uh, the, t the leaders of the campaign call, uh, call on us occasionally when they need our help. And, uh, but we are their ally, we are their, we, we stand in solidarity with them, we act with them in their tactics and we, we continue to love them dearly. Thank you. It's, it's, very, it's very good what you explained because we have a context now where, where this started and, and, and it's very interesting to see how the role of Agile changed over time from being this organizer at the very beginning, from then being a coach and now just like being kind of uh, outside, but just like sometimes coaching and you mentioned like coaching depending, sometimes it can be uh, the hurt the heart, the head or the hands, no? So you can identify where the challenge are. I think that um, it could be very interesting, Nariman, now to know a little bit your story. And I imagine Rim and Nisreen working together, going to Erby, going to the different cities to identify, okay, uh, to recruit people. And you were in one of those workshops. What happened there? What was, it, what, what was your situation then? And how it was that you, you got involved in the campaign?
نريمان مرحبا اميليا شكرا لاستضافتك اليوم لنا للمؤتمر بس انا حابب اذكر دائما واحكي قديش مهم انه الواحد يحكي قصته وهي بحسها الاساس بالحمله اللي وصلتنا لاحنا اللي كنا في البدايه انا اشتغلت معلمه 15 سنه وتعرضت لكثير من الانتهاكات وظلم وكانت هاي الانتهاكات مختلفة وما كنت عارف انها اصلا انتهاكات ولا كنت عارف انها هي ظلم كنت اداوم دوام حصص بيوم كامل بدون اجر اضافي كنت ممنوع اخذ اجازة كنت مرافقة بالباص مع طلابي بدون اجر ما كنت راد اخذ راتب الحد الادنى كنت اخذ سبعين دولار بس وبتذكر بوحدة من المدارس اللي انا اشتغلت فيها اني طلبت من صاحب المدرسه انه يشركني بالضمان الاجتماعي وبنهايه السنه لما اجيت اشيك على حالي انه هو شركني بالضمان ولا لا رحت اسال واشيك ولا بيحكي لي موظف الضمان انه انت ما لك اسم عنا تخيل السنه كامله بتشتغلي وانت مؤمنه بهذا الشخص انه بيحكي لك انا اشركتك بالضمان بالاخر طلع هو بيكذب علي ومش مشركني بالضمان شو شعوري بده يكون بهذيك اللحظه اكيد شعور حزن حتى اني بتذكر اني طلعت بالشارع وانا ببكي لكن بصراحة هي كانت نقطة مفصلية بحياتي وكانت هي أول لأ بحياتي إني أنا أحكي ما رح أستمر وفعلا تركت المدرسة وما سألت معني كنت بآخر السنة واشتغلت مدرسة أحسن أشركوني بالضمان وحصلت على راتبي لكن النقطة اللي فصلت حياتي وخلتني أتنور أكثر إنه في يوم من الأيام أجاني اتصال من مؤسسة أهل ودعوني لورشة وهاي الورشة بتذكر كنا 35 معلمة ومعلم المعلم الوحيد اللي اجى حضر معنا وحتى ما كمل الورشه طلع بنص الورشه. بهاي الورشه كانت نسرين الحاج من مؤسسه اهل هي الميسره في ذلك اليوم، صراحه هو كان يوم طويل وبس طريقه التيسير كانت عندها رائعه لدرجه انه لما يسرت الجزئيه بين 35 معلمه انهم يكشفوا اللي جواهم بقصصهم واللي صارت صرت يعني انا وانا قاعده اسمع هاي القصص احس انها قصص متشابهه كلها بتشبه بعض تشبه قصتي يعني قصة هاي المعلمة مع هاي المعلمة عم تشبه قصتي بس الفرق بيناتنا انه الظلم كان مختلف الانتهاكات اللي كانوا يمارسوها اصحاب المدارس علينا بنهاية الورشة حكت لنا نسرين الحاج مين بتحب فيكم تنضم للطالب بحقوق المعلمات والمعلمين بالمدارس الخاصة للأسف من 35 رفعنا ايدينا بس أربع معلمات وبلشنا بطريقنا وطريقنا يعني الصراحة كان فيه خوف قلق توتر أسود طريق مظلم مش عارفين لوين إحنا رايحين بس مشينا شكلنا فريق كنا سبع معلمات مدينة إربد الآن صرنا خمسين معلمة للفريق المؤسس من حملة قم مع المعلم عندنا أربعة آلاف عقاعدة البيانات بحملة قم مع المعلم صار عندنا 19 ألف متابع على صفحتنا على الفيسبوك الصراحة في نهاية العام بال2015 الوقت اللي بلشنا فيه إنه نعمل حملة قمع المعلم ونشكل فريقنا في مدينة إربد أنا في هذا العام تعرضت له تحدي إني أنا انفصلت من عملي بس أنا خلال ست أشهر كنت مع أهل تقود قيادتي تدربت على قوة القيادة فصار إشي من جواي اللي شوية من الخوف اللي جواي بالعتم اللي أنا ماشي فيها صار يطلع منه شوية ضوء عشان هيك أنا مشيت وما سألت صح كنت بالبداية حزينة إن بعد كل جهدي كمعلمة متفانية في مكان عملي لطلابي وبحافظ إني أدرس بمهارات تدريس قوية وبدرس كنت ثانوية عامة يعني مش بدرس طلاب ولاد صغار وبالنهاية لمجرد إني أنا دخلت الحملة ودعيت لمؤتمر للإنصاف بالأجور تم فصلي من عملي واعتبرني نكرة ما بحق لي أني أحضر هذا المؤتمر من هون طلعت أنا وفريقي وبلشنا بقيادتنا ومش أنا لحالي قصتي بتشبه قصة صفية اللي ولا مرة صفية بحياتها أخذت رواتب الصيف مع أنها بتشتغل بنفس المدرسة بس كل سنة صفية بتم حرمانها من رواتب الصيف تخيلوا معاي هبة اللي بحياتها ما أخذت راتب إلا أقل من الحد الأدنى وهذا الراتب يا دوب إنه 
بس يكفيها مواصلات وما بيعيل أسرتها تخيلوا معي قصة هديل اللي معانا بالحملة اللي هي مهندسة وكانت بتشتغل بشركة وفجأة راحت لأنه أنهت الشركة المشروع راحت تشتغل بمدرسة خاصة ما وكانت هي قوية وبتعرف عن القانون بس تكتشف أنه أنا مش من حقي أني أنا أشترك بالضمان الاجتماعي لأنه هيك الإجراءات بالمدرسة مع أنه هذا هذا حق إلها تخيلوا معي نوازش من عجلون معلمة بتشتغل ما بتعرف أني أنا لازم أوقع على عقد من هون من قصصنا اللي بتشبه بعض إحنا المعلمات تجمعنا كفريق كانت قصصنا قصص فيها ظلم قررنا إن نحطها كلها مع بعض ونحولها لأمل وهذا الحزن نطفيه ويصير بدل منه فرح وسعادة ونمشي بطريقنا مع بعض قوينا مع بعض تدربنا كتير تدريبات من خلال مؤسسة أهل شكراً أهل شكراً نسرين شكراً ريم لا أحكي لأهل ولا وخاصة نسرين وريم لأنه الصراحة نسرين كانت معلم وملهم لغاية هاي اللحظة لحملة قمع المعلم وبحكي شكرا لريم لأنه ريم ما بتتعامل معنا كمنظمة ريم بنهاية تعامل معنا كشخص مؤمن بقضيتنا شخص دايما بساندنا وحليف إنا من بداية 2015 لغاية هاي اللحظة Thank you very much, Nariman, for this broad explanation. It's because you really, you really show how it is not the situation of one person. With a public narrative, we can, I can explain my story. In this case, you can explain your story. And I, I watched so many videos in which you, you explain your, your story. But it's not just one story. It's just, with the public narrative, we really show these structural pro, uh, problems that are that are that are present and which characterize um, the situation. So it's very it's very compelling and it's also an, uh, a show of of of, uh, of of courage and also um, where where did you get the hope and the and 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 the courage to 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 go and take the lead? That's very interesting. Um, also. Um, as I was doing the research, uh, it was very interesting to see how, because of of working since the very beginning, uh, doing this, using this organizing model and using public narratives, sharing with each other these stories, like being very intentional with it, with it. So sharing stories in a very intentional way and in a very um, in a very sincere way. So I observed that this was very important at the time of like setting the common grounds for the for the team to learn how to work together, to really like be honest and be sincere in, in really put together this team culture. So I wonder if maybe uh, Yunis Rin and, and Yuna Riman also can comment on this. How? Because of really putting a, a solid uh, foundation around there, um, of building strong social relationship between the members. This later on was useful to allow, allow teachers to set up norms, to hold each other's accountable at the time to have to distribute tasks, for instance, or to, to agree on norms. So very basic things that are important at the time of organizing, but things that not, not, not all the time we do because we many times we don't know how to work uh, on teams. So maybe Yunis Rin and Yun, uh, Nariman can also comment on this. Because of course, Yunis Rin were saying this as an outsider with a lot of experience in your own, having coached more than uh, 19, 20 campaigns already. And you, Nariman, were, were, you were learning this. Um, so I think, uh, the, the th I think the first point I'd, li um, I'd like to emphasize is uh, the way we do public narrative is not like, hey, come tell a story. So there is something specific in a way about it. And we focus on the, ch the choice that one exercises in front of the challenge and the outcome of that choice. So in coaching others to tell a story that emphasizes or that brings out these three elements, challenge, choice, and outcome, you are basically asking people to say why or when and how did you become an agent? When and how did you become a leader of yourself? 
And I think the first point is there, working with others um, and with ourselves to own those kinds of stories. Uh, to tell our identity or tell our who we are from that angle, from an angle of um, choice and, um, and result, uh, which unfortunately many journalistic um, agencies don't do when they talk to people who face uh, injustice. They focus on the challenge. So that's not the idea of the story that we, we facilitate or we coach. Um, and when you focus or help people focus on their, on their choice, in that relation, in that coaching, there's a relationship being built. So when Nariman does that conversation with Hadil, her colleague, or another teacher in her school, they're building a bond around choice in the face of challenge, without ignoring challenge. So I think that's the seed. And then from there, when you... Um, when you uh, nurture or when you coach multiple stories being shared around the table, each one of it, you're looking, you're digging deep for the time that you, for the time that one acted and exercised choice. Then uh, one story after the other, after the other, um, a certain set of values emerge from those stories. And those values become the collective identity. So now we have individual agency and we have collective agency around choice, but we also have um, clearer values that have come out every time one of us shared um, her stories of her story of leadership or of choice or of action. So now you have a community that comes around um, shared values and, and that builds relationships and that builds power, but it also builds um, empathy and understanding of one another. And I think with that, in that equation of agency and collective agency and value, shared values and empathy, you can hold each other accountable. It becomes reasonable and actually it becomes the respectful thing to do to hold each other accountable, not in the sense of blame, but in the sense of uh, empowering each other, in the sense of what's the problem, why aren't things going, um, going forward for our common cause, for our set of values. So um, I think that, that makes it easier to build a culture, uh, a culture of shared leadership, of uh, learning, reflection, because with every story told, there's reflection and there is, um, um, meaning making. Um, I will hand on over, but uh, one last point. Um, I, I kind of spoke about story of self and story of us, the collective agency and the shared values. Then there's the story of now in which we say, okay, what is urgent? What is urgent for us now to do, to act? Um, where do we get the hope from? Like what, what gives us hope that we can achieve change? And then with that comes a specific purpose. This is what we need to do. So you add to the equation shared purpose as well from values, from urgency. Thank you. No, and that's, that's um, that would make uh, this, this framework for leadership to be very, relational, deeply relational, and deeply experiential and reflexive. It's, it's, it's dialogue itself, and it's dialogue in its true and in its true meaning. Now, Iman, do you want to add something to it? Maybe a specific example of how this, have, uh, this has worked in the context of the campaign? Uh, فريق مع بعض حكيت إنه إحنا كنا ماشيين بطريق الصراحة كان في خوف وقلق وكنا حاسين حالنا إنه رايحين لإشي مش عارفين إيش هو بس اللي كان يقوينا داخل الفريق الواحد الدورات التدريبية اللي كل مرة كانت تعزز قيادتنا وقوتنا أكتر كل ما نأخذ دورة قيادة أو دورة تدريب 
بالتنظيم المجتمعي دورة رعاية الذات كيف إنه إحنا نهتم بأنفسنا ونعبر عن عن ما يدور في داخلنا هاي صرنا نفصح عن قصصنا بطريقة أوضح مع بعض صارت قصصنا توضح لبعض صرنا نحس إنه في رابط قوي بجمعنا مع بعض حتى إحنا الفريق بنت بيناتنا علاقة لدرجة إنه العلاقة اللي صارت بين أعضاء الفريق مش بس ناريمان من إربد هديل من عمان ديما من الزرقاء لا صرنا نحس رغم رغم انه كل حدا من محافظه مختلفه الى انه احنا من الخمس محافظات فريق واحد تفكيرنا واحد نتعرض للتصادمات مع بعض بس كنا دائما بنقوي وبنعزز علاقاتنا مع بعض هلا اكثر شيء بتحسي دائما انه بروايه القصص بين بعضنا كفريق كان يعززنا مع بعض اللي هو تقوية العلاقات الداخلية بيناتنا كانت هاي هي اللي بتقوي وبتزيد عزيمتنا بعدين بعد ما نحكي قصصنا مع بعض وأنا أشعر فيها وهي تشعر فيا كنا نرجع نحكي طب شو لازم نعمل شو هو التصرف اللي إحنا هلأ بدنا نعمل شو مطلبنا لهاي السنة لما بلشنا بشكل منظم يبدأ تدريبنا مع أهل بشكل منظم كيف يكون إن استراتيجية كيف بنينا محاور هاي الاستراتيجية نحط هدف رؤية للحملة طب ما أنا بدي العدالة أنا بدي أصل لهاي العدالة بس كيف بدي أصل لهاي العدالة فمن هون لما بلش إنه بناء استراتيجية واضحة صار يتنور أكثر الطريق قدامنا فبتحسي إنه التعلم تبعنا صار فيه صرنا نستخدمه توعية تثقيف للمعلمات بعمل اجتماع واحد لواحد مع معلمة جديدة بحكي لها بشجعها إنها بعطيها أنا مباشرة بدخل بحكي لها إذا معك وقت بدي أحكي معاكي بحكي لها والله أنا هيك هيك صار معي مباشرة بمدرستي أنت صار معك نفس الموقف شوي شوي بتحسي إنه هاي المعلمة صارت بتحكي بتشاركني قصتها بحكي لها طب مرة حكيتي لا شوي شوي بتحسي إنه هاي المعلمة آه أنا حكيت لا بحشدها بدربها بدخلها جوات الفريق مدام هي حكت لا سهل إني أنا أدخلها لفريقي بحشد واحد لواحد في التوعي والتثقيف للمعلمات بتذكر اول جلسات التوعي والتثقيف اللي عملناها بحمله قم مع المعلم وانا حكيت لك اياها ايميليا كنا نجتمع بمنازلنا نجيب خمسه او سته معلمات جوات مدينه اربد نجيبهم ونجمعهم بمنازلنا على فنجان قهوه نبلش نشجعهم كيف نحكي مع بعض ونتناقش ونتحاور شوي شويه ما بنحس اللي هي حكت قصصنا واخذ منها التزام بالاخر مجرد ما اخذت منها التزام انا حشتها وزادت وانت عارفه انه احنا كان دائما راسمين بحملتنا انه صوتي لحالي ما بنفع، صوت هذيل معايم برضه ما بنفع، لازم يزيد عددنا وعشان يزيد عددنا ونقدر نحصل على وتزيد بتزيد قوتنا وبالتالي احنا بنحصل بيكون مطلبنا على الارض اقوى لقدام صناع القرار، فصار كان فكان همنا بعد ما نتعلم احنا نعلم الاخرين، نعلم معلمات اخرات اخريات، نجيب هدول المعلمات ونعلمهم ونقويهم، نعمل لهم مهارات تدريس لتصير معلمه متميزه في داخل الغرفه الصفيه، نعلمهم على القانون ويعرفوا عن حقوقهم، نعلمهم على العقد الموحد، نعلمهم كيف يقووا ذاتهم بمواضيع مختلفه مثل كيف تقول لا في داخل مدرستها، واستطعنا احنا بعد هيك انه نشكل بتوسعه بحمله قم مع المعلم بعد ما توسعنا بخمس محافظات وصار فريق كبير قدرنا انه نعمل خمس لجان وظائفيه هاي اللجان الوظائفيه كان دورها وتركيزها هي التعلم اللي طلع من سرد قصصنا اللي صار صار فيها مهمات وادوار لكل عضوه تقدر تقوم بدورها في المهمه اللي تلتزم فيها وتدير فريقها وتدير اللجنه اللي بتشتغل عليها وهذا اللي كان دائما بيفتح افق للحمله بهدف استراتيجي بدايه السنه كيف نشتغل كيف يفتح لنا تكتيكات لحمله قمه المعلم كيف نصل للمطلب للشيء الملح ولازم وكيف نقف على الارض مع بعض فهاي اللجان الوظائفيه كان لها دور ومهمات بتحسي انه والتزامنا مع بعض هو اللي خلى انه يكون النضال مستمر مع بالحمله شكرا لك ايميل
I see that, thank you, Nariman. I see that we are talking also about the structure of the campaign and how the campaign was able to, to build itself and in an organization in an organizational structure, which is also, also very important. And of course, uh, Ahel uh, has been um, coaching and I guess that uh, um, um, supporting and, and yeah, coaching uh, on that. Um, just thinking on the impact that the campaign has had at the socio-cultural level, and this question goes for you, Reem, and you, Reem, maybe you want to comment on something. I wonder, um, I was, I observed, especially when, when reviewing the secondary data, um, that in 2013, of course, this was not a topic at the political and at the public agenda. And now it's, that's a topic. And, and it's a topic in the public and in the political agenda with a very specific shape, let's say. So it's a topic where you, you have this campaign, which is an organized actor, an organized and recognized legitimate actor, which which is giving a message showing the vulnerability of many teachers who are explaining the situation of, of labor rights violations through which they have gone, but at the same time, like showing what their hope and showing that they, 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 they have already achieved so many relevant uh, steps and um, that they have the power to organize and to, and to come together and to fight and to occupy a space, a, soci a, a space in society with, with is, which is traditional, traditionally um, held for men. And that's not just in Jordan, it's also happening everywhere. It's an, a structural thing. So I wonder, Rim, how have you seen that? Also like taking a look from an institutional perspective, how this change in the game uh, has occurred? I hope I understood your question, Amelia. So basically what uh, we did, uh, you know, as uh, Nariman and uh, Nesrin mentioned, there was quite a bit of trust building within the campaign, the core team of the campaign, and when they expanded. The same thing we did with different institutions. So as you mentioned at the beginning, it, was, it all started from the National Committee for Pay Equity. And the National Committee for Pay Equity, if you want to see the structure of the National Committee for Pay Equity, actually it has 32 organizations. So some of them were with the idea of, of uh, going with the campaign, some of them were against it. So we had to look at the at the right button to, to press, if that's the right uh, word to use. And that's when we started, you know, to show why this is badly needed, you know, the support badly needed. So uh, here we, we tried again to find champions in these organizations, women champions, and in many cases, uh, feminist men uh, within these organizations. And again, we had to build trust or we built trust with these people. They were just individuals here and there, and we built trust with them. And that's how basically we started to knock on the doors of different uh, institutions to be able you know, to, to lobby for, for the demands of, of that came out from the campaign during their sessions on the strategy and, and so on and so forth. So, and what we did at the beginning, we used to play a main role just to connect, to connect them with decision makers, but then actually now after all these years, they're doing it about on the, on, by themselves. They don't even, only when they need us, when they cannot reach a policymaker, then they come and, connect, uh, and contact us. Now, now they have a solid network. They can lobby on their own. And we're also trying to learn from the experience of the stand-up teachers to, to build other campaigns uh, with similar with similar process and with similar, you know, uh, with similar thinking, with using the community organizing that Ahel uses here in Jordan with different campaigns, as you have mentioned. So, um, so that's what we tried to do to 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 basically also empower the 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 the, the campaign uh, members. And uh, again, you know, we're so happy now after six years of, of different support from us and from other entities, especially Ahel in particular, Nisreen and her team as well. Now we feel they only come to us when they need the support. And um, we're so happy that they're doing many of their activities on their own. And we, we actually, we also asked the Stand Up with Teachers campaign to share their knowledge and their expertise with other campaigns in Jordan. Actually, their, their, uh, their campaign has been shared also with Palestine. So, uh, and Nariman uh, is now in contact with the, with the union in Palestine because they also want to use the same methodology in, in, in Palestine, again, with the same education, with the education sector in particular, because it's a sector that employs women the most. And going back to the study, by the way, when we did the study, we were talking about um, gender pay gap 
But in reality, and Nariman and Nisreen mentioned that, in reality, the violations were much harsher than what we have, uh, we have basically uh, seen in the study, in the initial study that we had in 2013. It was way, way more harsher than what we thought. So, uh, so we tried to find solutions. And still, you know, there are many issues that we still are, are working on. Over to you, Amelia. Mm -hmm. No, thank you very much for, for saying that. And that also, also makes me think, and this is a case where you, you mentioned that at the very beginning with where there is a coalition or, or different grassroots actors working together with the collaboration of AHEL, with the collaboration of governmental bodies, the ILO. So I wonder, uh, is this case being uh, replicated to other sectors or it has the, the potential to be, I don't know, replicated, for instance, to the healthcare or the, are there attempts from the ILO? Because if this is a successful case, let's call it that way, is there, an, is there the intention that maybe not this time Rima's Lama, as Nisreen mentioned at the ILO, but the ILO itself can scale it up further? Actually, we tried with the health sector, but the health sector is way more complicated. We tried with AHEL and uh, because it's fragmented, the health sector. But what happened during COVID-19, based on the experience that we had with the Stand Up as Teachers campaign, female owners of KGs and private schools came to us. Because during COVID-19, they were also badly hit, financially badly hit. And if they close their schools, that means teachers will lose their jobs. So we were able to organize them and we succeeded with many things. Like they were able to reschedule their loans, they were able to benefit from social security uh, programs to, to get some financial support to cover part of the wages and so on. And there are many, many steps that we succeeded with. And that campaign only started in, or that coalition actually, it's a coalition, they started only in November. But we were able to use the same methodology and the same process with the owner, with female owners of private schools and, uh, and KGs, because the female owners we felt they had you know, more commitment to the legislation, labor legislation in Jordan, meaning they didn't want to reduce the salaries of their teachers. They didn't want you know, to end contracts of, cert of, of teachers. They, they didn't want to stop enrolling them in social protection. There was this part of like, as we all know, and there are studies about that, women are usually more committed to legislation. They usually, there is less corruption and so on. And there are st many studies on, on that topic. So, we're trying to help them as much as possible, and we're trying as well to, uh, to, to find some solutions for them. But again, Ministry of Education is part of the game, Social Protection is part of the game, the Central Bank of Jordan is part of the game. So we're empowering them so they can also lobby for their, for their rights, actually. Some of it are, are, are their rights, you know, and because in Jordan, again, there was more focus on male, uh, male dominated sectors, if you wish. Uh, so they looked at the tourism sector, for example, they looked at transportation and other sectors and where there were special programs for them, but none of the programs were tailored for women owned businesses or, or, or sectors where, where women are more focused. So we're trying also to work with the government on that. Uh, and again, you know, to me, trust is very, very important between uh, the team, the core team of any coalition or group but also trust with officials. If the officials, they see that there, there is, you know, genuine demands and there is a reason and you have solid justifications and so on, and you send, you know, letters and Ariman was part of the process. We sent letters right, left, left and center during COVID-19 because also teachers were losing their jobs during COVID-19 and we helped with the inspectors and so on. There is quite a bit of that kind of pushing with the, what you call the, like the screen always, you call it the power within and power over. So we try to use it depending on the situation. We try to use it, you know, uh, with, with, with officials. Um, so yeah, so yeah, we tried it with, uh, in this case, female owners of, uh, of private schools and ki uh, kindergartens. And we know others are using it for the nurseries, uh, which is basically like the crash in the States. And as I mentioned earlier, the ILO, we're keen on um, copying this example to Palestine. Actually, the ILO is copying this example to Palestine because we do have an ILO team as well in Palestine. And uh, Nariman went, met with them in Turin and she shared the experience of Stand Up Teachers campaign in Turin in Rome, where we have the ITC, the international, the ILO um, training center. Over to you, Emilia. Thank you. Nariman, is the campaign collaborating, still collaborating with the with the team in Palestine? Uh, 
الاطار لسه ما زالت عن طريق السيده عائشه هي ممكنه مديره التمكين النسائي في النقابات العمال العماليه في فلسطين بتبعث لي ايميلات في بعض الاسئله يخلقوا فرق كيف كيف لا يحشدوا هذا الفريق شو الاسلوب اللي يستخدموه احيانا بتبعث لي انه كيف تشجع هذول المعلمات انهم دائما يكون عندهم شيء منظم اللي هي احنا تعلمنا من خلال ريم مناع من مؤسسه اهل كيف دائما انه احنا نكون فريق منظم هذا اول شيء تعلمناه بالقياده اللي هو عمل اجنده بوقت محدد خارطه الطريق واضحه امامنا من بدايه السنه بنحط استراتيجيتنا كيف بنمشي خلال خطوات عملنا خلال السنه شو التكتيكات المنحنى القمم اللي بدنا نصلها كيف نحتفل بهاي القمم وبالنهايه العام كيف نقيم فهم كانوا دائما يمشوا بطريقه غير ممنهجه وحكينا لهم انه دائما احنا تعلمنا طريقه المنهج الواضح والطريق الواضح من خلال التنظيم المجتمعي ومؤسسه الاهل انه نكون دائما واضحين اثناء الطريق عارفين شو بدنا نعمل احيانا ما بيكون عارفين انه ممكن ننجح او نفشل بس احنا بنشتغل يعني ما ما كان يهمنا النجاح او الفشل كان مهم انه احنا ماشيين وعم نشتغل بطريقه ممنهجه وواضحه فهي دائما بنقدم لهم مثال من حمله قم مع المعلم كيف تصرفنا بشيء معين وببعث لهم اياه من خلال الايميلات بيني وبين عائشه Thank you. Um, this question links to a question that we have in the Q&A and, and, and also to a question that I want to put to you, Nisreen. The question says, um, I used to teach in an UNN or WA school, and I think a campaign like this is a very needed there. Do you work with the United Nations or WA schools and teachers, or do you think that the campaign has the potential to connect with teachers of different national backgrounds? or if there are still barriers to that kind of collaboration, what are they? And these questions makes me uh, think, Nisreen, if you, if you can comment on, well, as I was saying at the beginning, this is the 10th anniversary of AHEL, and you have a lot of experience building connections between Palestine, between Jordan, between uh, Lebanon, Syria. So what can you say about that? Because of course, like, this campaign has been very successful, and of course it might be setting setting um, being the role uh, for other campaigns to happen. What are the key, the key lessons that we need to take into account from an organizing model here? Or that you as an organization that is coaching campaigns uh, could like to, to leave us with this message? Um, okay, these are many questions, but the first one on the UNRWA schools in Jordan. Um, they are they have a they are semi unionized they are well organized the teachers who uh, who work at UNRWA. and uh, every few years they organize themselves and demands for their uh, salary raise or for some sorts of benefits and there is no restriction on their organizing it kind of links to the question before it by zachary sheldon in jordan uh, organizing, especially union labor organizing is not free. It's not uh, allowed freely. There are many restrictions on it. So for example, the stand up with the teachers campaign, uh, they are really a union. They, they pursue complaints from the teachers, they take them to the Ministry of Labor. They organize themselves demanding change in policies. They have membership, uh, you know, between quotation, they have teachers who are members in the campaign who take teaching skills uh, trainings. They have legal awareness and legal education. Uh, they have so much that you can say this is a union, but in Jordan, uh, unions are restricted. If they go now and submit a request to, to register a union legally, they will be denied. The law says there is one union for every sector and that this union is already established. Although the union already established is for teachers 
from all public schools as well as private schools. And they, the Stand Up With The Teachers campaign, they present the teachers from the private schools. So it makes sense for them to be their own union because their situation, their demands are different. Um, but that is not allowed. So it's important to note to everyone here that they operate the Stand Up With The Teachers as, as what we refer to informal group, meaning they're not registered. They can't receive dues. They can't take money. They can't even, um, they can't book in a, in a hotel or in a place, um, a training room because they are not registered. And yet they continue with such um, strength. The UNRWA teachers, they have more space. They can organize more and they are more organized. Um, so that's to address the, the question. Um, and I think uh, Neriman has connections with teachers who are working at UNRWA and um, they know of the stand up with the teachers campaign, but they follow different set of uh, rules. The, their employer is the UN, is UNRWA. Um, so on your other question about uh, organizing, it's such a broad question. It's a huge, it is, but it is. Uh, I know because I know that this is going to be kind of the last question. I and I want you to make like uh, yes, a reflection okay. on this. What are your takeaways so from this over a decade of organizing? Um, okay, not over a decade, but on well, a decade, uh, say. on the stand up with the teacher. I do want to highlight the popular education a little bit more the popular education program, because many teachers didn't really want to join the stand up with the teachers campaign. They were afraid. At some point in time, the owners of the schools in the month of May, they pressured the teachers to sign a resignation so they don't pay them summer pay, rehire them in August. They started asking them in one of the years, do you belong to the stand up with the teachers campaign to frighten them basically. So then the popular education circles with the Paulo Ferreri's approach to like emancipatory learning, but we added to it the stories at the beginning, uh, the commitment at the end. So it's not just space to, to reflect and to deliberate, which is important, but it is also a space to take commitment to act, whether um, some teachers used to put norms with their students in the classroom, Others would commit to talking to other teachers in their schools. Um, others committed to like getting a driver's license um, and getting, a, you know, getting herself to drive despite her family's uh, opposition. And um, I think it's a very interesting mix, the popular education program, because it has the story at the beginning. So an example, one of the sessions is about why do we not say no to authority. What is it about our psych psychology or about our upbringing or about our culture that makes us not say no in the face of oppression? And they start with sharing stories where they did take some action. It worked. It didn't. Not the best of actions in the face of uh, oppression. And that story telling open space for more reflection on what, why do I do that? Why am I um, um, wired that way. Um, anyway, I want to highlight that, but the uh, last sentence is um, we're very, we're always very grateful to Professor Marshall Gans for the community organizing uh, approach and methodology. The narrative is one of the practices and the others fill together. They all, they're very, because you can't talk about relationships without talking narrative. So they're, they're all tied together. Um, yeah. Um, and we've added the popular education to that combination. So yes, that's, thank you very much for mentioning that. We put that in the, in the research case that is published, but this is very interesting because it's how you specifically in Jordan has adapted public narrative through popular education. So for this, for this thing, it's that public narrative is, is a framework. It's a framework which is adapted so in so many different ways across the world. And it's adapted to each different countries in different ways. But it's adapted like keeping, of course, its relationality, it, the, the relational aspect, this 
uh, the fact of being experiential. So keeping its very core components. That's that's a, a very a very good example. And yes, we we could organize a different tab just on the popular education circles. Because we are uh, running out of time, um, I could like to thank you all, uh, Nariman, Nirin, and Rim. I also could like to thank Professor Marshall Gant, who has been uh, helping and coaching and, and giving advice uh, through to this research. And I really hope that we can continue collaborating together and more publications will come. So thank you very much for having spent the afternoon uh, to, to today. And um, yes, I, I hope that um, that we that you that you keep succeeding with the campaign. Thank you.